So we are, have another session before the networking break, uh, talk about sea level rise. So Ben will kick off the first, um, first talk on, from the space perspective, and then Professor Mark Merrifield from Scripps will talk about in situ sea level rise and coastal impact adaptation. Ben, the floor is yours. All right, thanks. All right, so thanks for the introduction. I, I'm a research scientist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, I'm the team lead of the NASA sea level change team, so kind of look broadly at sea level using satellites um, and trying to, to solve a number of problems. But today I'm going to talk specifically about the satellite observations of sea level that we have. And uh, as with any good talk, I'm going to start with social media disinformation. So uh, with, at JPL, we get uh, regular requests from reporters who see something on, say, Facebook or Twitter, some kind of post goes viral. Um, and they come to us and say, is this true? Is this accurate? Can you tell us why or why not, why or why not this might not be right? Um, and one of these requests came in recently. I want to start off with this just to give some framing to what I'll discuss. So you've all heard the, the expression a rising tide lifts all ships. But what if all the ships cause the rising tide? So the claim is that sea level is rising because so many ships are being put into the ocean. It's not because of global warming. So this came about, it was on Facebook, shared like 100,000 times, I don't know, whatever it may be. So this reporter from USA Today contacted us and said, this doesn't seem right, but can you actually put some numbers to it? Um, so I had a, a few reactions when this request came in. So the first was risk versus reward. Should I really engage with this? Do I, do I spend my time doing this and trying to resolve this issue? I can make a simple math mistake. That would be embarrassing. Do I really want to do this? The next question is how many ships are actually in the ocean? And some of you may have a better answer to that or some of the people at this meeting, but uh, some simple questions, how many ships are actually in the ocean? This graphic got attached to um, that, that Facebook post. So it looks like there's a lot of ships there, but then how big is a ship, right? So if, if there are all these ships, how big is a ship? How much water could it actually displace? But my core reaction was that it's definitely not true. And the reason we know it's not true is because of the satellite observations we have. So maybe common sense, you could say it's not true, but we can actually put numbers to this. And that's, that's what I wanna walk through exactly how we know immediately that this kind of claim is not true because of the satellite observations that we have. All right, so based on our understanding of, of the ocean and how climate change is proceeding, we know there's two main reasons that sea level is going up on global scales. So I'm not talking about kind of local regional scales to get, in more, get into that more later in my talk and Mark will talk about that. But on these very broad global scales, there's two reasons and they're both associated with global warming. So the first is that the ocean is absorbing heat about 90% of that trapped heat uh, due to uh, the greenhouse gas effect or greenhouse effect gets trapped by the ocean, absorbed, and then as water warms, it expands. So there's this thermal expansion. The other is that ice is melting. So the parts of the earth that are covered by ice are warming. That ice that's on land melts and then it flows into the ocean. So we have these two effects that are happening. So if we take this one step further, we know that on these global scales, if we add up that mass, and then that thermal expansion component, and then sum those together, you should get total sea level, right? That should add up. We should be able to understand exactly what's contributing and then see that it matches the total. And fortunately, we have observations of each of these three pieces, right? So we have the addition of the mass that comes from the ice. We have the thermal expansion, which comes from in situ observations from something called the Argo profiling floats. And then we have a measure of total sea level from satellite altimetry. So I want to walk through each of these quickly and just explain the observing system we have and what exactly it's measuring. So I'm going to start out with this uh, total sea level, the altimetry piece. All right, so before we had satellites, the main way that we measured sea level was from tide gauges. So over the past couple centuries, we have these tide gauges. This is a, a map of uh, the uh, one of the data sets that's maintained for tide gauges. You can see that these tide gauges are located um, Across the globe, there's a bias certainly towards the northern hemisphere. There's more tide gauges in the northern hemisphere. Most of the gauges are located along uh, coastlines of the, the larger continents, but you do have some island gauges. But in general, you have a lot of gaps, right? There's a lot of pieces missing, um, a lot of air, parts of the ocean that are not being sampled. And if you go back in time, this is the current observation network. If you go back in time, it gets much worse, right? You have fewer gauges, you have stronger biases in terms of uh, where they are geographically. But more recently, we have what we call satellite altimeters. Okay, so these are radar altimeters that are orbiting above the Earth. They're measuring the height of the ocean from space. So from about 1,300 kilometers up, we're able to measure the height of the ocean to about a one inch accuracy. Okay, so it's a pretty simple measurement concept. Sending a radar pulse down to the ocean, it bounces off the surface of the ocean, 
travels back to the satellite. You can measure the time it takes for that pulse to travel. And from that, you can infer after some corrections, infer the height of the ocean. So we get very accurate measurements. This is the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite. It's uh, sometimes referred to as Snoopy's doghouse. It does look a little bit like a, uh, a house, I guess, or doghouse. But um, this is the most recent altimeter that, that we've launched back in 2020. Um, but here's a little graphic of how it samples. So as it orbits the Earth, it's measuring the point directly beneath it. So it's uh, nadar, nadar pointing and sampling a long track. So it, it has a particular track that it follows over the ocean. Every 10 days, it repeats this track. Um, you can see there it's measuring. This is an El Nino that it's measuring. Um, the satellite itself does not fill in those gaps. That's uh, some gridding that was done um, after the fact. But you get this complete view of the ocean every 10 days. Okay, so we're able to see the ocean with these satellites. Um, and one other look at this, this gives you an idea of uh, the um, actual roughness of the ocean and that you can see the tracks a little bit better. So these are not filled in. So this is starting in 1992. That's the start of our modern, modern altimeter record. Um, you can see how over time you see these different features that are propagating. This is um, going forward 10 days at a time. Um, but again, we have this complete global view. If you remember back to what I showed with the tide gauges where we had kind of limited sampling, uh, we now see this uh, pretty complete coverage, um, at least for most of the ocean. All right. And uh, just to note, the recent, the record of the altimeters uh, span, now spans three decades. So with the launch of the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich altimeter, um, we go back, uh, or we have this record, seamless record, continuous overlapping between all these missions, which allows us to calibrate and validate the different missions. Um, but this record now is go, goes from 1992 on up to present, that Sentinel-6 satellite is still collecting data, so it's continuing to lengthen. So we have this nice long record. And what can we do with it? We can measure global mean sea level. So we average all that data together at each point in time, and we get the trend in global mean sea level. So this is how much sea level is increasing from 1992 to present. Uh, the rate is about 3.4 millimeters per year or 1.4 inches per decade. That may not seem that impressive, but as you start to build up that record over time, you can see that we've added about 10 centimeters of, of global sea level um, over the past 30 years. And this rate is accelerating. I'm not showing it here, but every decade, uh, the rate gets about one millimeter per year higher than the previous decade. Okay, so we see a very clear view. Uh, some noteworthy things here, it's, there's not a lot of variations there. So whereas some of our other climate records, you see more ups and downs, this is pretty linear with that acceleration I was talking about. So it's a pretty unambiguous increase in global sea levels that we see from these satellites. All right, so stepping through these other two. So we have the total, now we're gonna look at the individual processes or the individual contributors. So the first one we'll look at is the addition of mass. And this comes from the GRACE, GRACE follow-on uh, series of satellites. So GRACE and GRACE follow-on, they're two separate missions, are actually two satellites, one following the other. And the only measurement they're making is the distance between those two satellites. So as they orbit the Earth, you can kind of see here, the, the distance between these satellites changes over time, and they respond to gravity changes on the surface of the Earth or within the Earth. Okay, so if you fly over, here we can see that example on the right. So as that first satellite goes to that, towards that mountain, it gets pulled towards it. So it feels the gravity of that mass, it gets pulled towards it. The uh, separation between the two satellites increases. As it flies past, it gets pulled back. The second satellite gets pulled towards it. So you have this constant interplay between the two satellites as they orbit the Earth. So it's actually a really cool type of observation, right? You're not measuring anything directly on the surface of the Earth, but you can start to infer these changes that are occurring. And one of the biggest changes in mass that's occurring on Earth is from the ice sheets. So this is the uh, Greenland ice sheet, uh, the data from the GRACE and GRACE follow-on. So GRACE was launched in 2002, GRACE follow-on in 2020 uh, or 2021. Um, I'm sorry, that's not right. In 2018, I'm getting my missions uh, mixed up. So there's a small gap between the two, but you have this nice long record and you can see exactly where mass is being lost from Greenland. You can show something similar for mountain glaciers across the, the globe. You can see something similar for the Antarctic ice sheet too. So this can all be done from space using those satellites that I just showed. All right, so if we add up all that contribution so we can see how much mass is coming off of these sources on land, going into the ocean, the rate of change from this uh, mass-driven component is about 2.1 millimeters per year, so about two-thirds of what we've seen from the altimetry. A slightly different record length, but um, again, about two millimeters per year. So then the last piece of this is not from satellites, but it's the thermal expansion, which comes from these Argo profiling floats. You can already do some simple math in your head. Hopefully, this is about a millimeter per year of, of sea level rise, but 
just to show a little bit of how this works. So these floats um, go through the ocean, they get moved by the currents, um, the, the, just the general movement of the ocean. And then every um, 10 days, they go to a depth of about 2000 meters and then come back to the surface um, and, and sample the temperature and salinity uh, within that water column. And then they go to the surface and they report back to the satellite, that data gets collected. And from that temperature and salinity data, we can measure the, the uh, steric and, and in case of the global um, signal, really the, the thermal, the temperature driven change on global scales. And just to give you an idea of the sampling we have from these, this is something I pulled down uh, this summer, you can pull down the, uh, the um, array of floats at any given time every day. Um, but you get a sense of how much coverage we have in the global ocean from these Argo floats. I can then take those, average those together. Again, I already uh, kind of spoiled it, but you get about a millimeter per year from there. We can sum these up, see if this works out. And I know there's a lot going on in this figure, but you have the thermal expansion from Argo here in green is that ocean mass from Grace and Grace Fall one. And blue is what we have from the altimetry. We can stack those up and see that they generally agree. There's some wiggles that do not, but in general, we have a good understanding of why sea level is changing on these global scales. All right, going back. So let's uh, do, do some simple math and uh, please don't check this uh, while I'm doing it because there, hopefully there's not a mistake, but um, so I did some simple Googling. This took about 10 minutes to do, about six or seven minutes of that was just to Google um, some of these things and try to find as reliable information as possible. But the number of commercial ships in the ocean at some date within the last decade was I found to be about 100,000. I'm sure that could be give or take a little bit. Dry weight tonnage of an average ship, about 20,000. Total amount of dry weight tonnage is then uh, 2,000 million. Volume of displaced water you can then convert. We know the surface area of the ocean. And then we get to this final result. The amount of sea level rise contributed by the ships in the ocean is about five microns. Okay. So a very small amount. So even though there are 100,000 ships of these bigger ships in the ocean, um, it's contributing a very small amount. And we know from our observations that the amount of sea level rise that's occurring every day is actually eight microns. So every day we're adding roughly the equivalent of all the ships in the ocean into the ocean. Okay, so again, that claim from Facebook, it's not, not holding up based on these, uh, these simple checks. We can look at this one other way. So. Um, we can look at it in terms of the mass loss coming, the amount of ice coming off of Greenland. So the average displacement of a very large container ship, about 1 million metric tons. The mass loss from Greenland, it's huge. So the Greenland mass loss that we see is the equivalent of adding 752 very large container ships into the ocean every day. Okay, so that gives you an idea of the scope of the ice that's coming off. This is just Greenland. You have a, a different contribution from the Antarctic, the mountain glaciers, um, but again, it's in terms of the sea level rise we're seeing, the factors contributing to it, it's just an, an incredibly large amount relative to this ship claim that was made. Um, so again, we have the data, we know why it's changing on global scales. And I just wanna connect to what Mark is gonna talk about with a couple more slides here. Um, so these altimeters I showed do measure regional sea level change as well. So I showed something similar to this. Again, this is just filled in. So not only do we have information on these global scales, we have information on regional and more local scales. And we can take this data and we can compute trends, not just over the full globe, but we can compute trends on a regional level, right? So these are the trends in sea level, the rate of rise of sea level from 1993 on up through the present. You can see there's some spatial variability here in California. We have a little bit less sea level rise than what you see in the East Coast. Um, so there's different processes beyond the one, the two that I discussed that drive changes on these, these more regional scales. But we also know what those are, right? So we know when the water comes off of the ice sheets, it's not gonna fill up the ocean like a bathtub, it's gonna go follow a particular pattern. We know there's a lot of other signals in the ocean that contribute to this. Um, so just to touch on those quickly, I mentioned the um, El Nino previously, but there's this large scale signal that we see here that affected here on the, uh, the West Coast um, in terms of our sea level that, uh, that we experience. But, we have these large natural variations in the ocean that contribute and can affect the trends that we measure over still these relatively short records. We also have what we call ice sheet fingerprints. So those, and you can probably tell from that, that uh, computation I did for the ships that there's so much ice, so much mass coming off of the ice sheets that you're actually affecting the gravitation, rotation and deformation of the earth, right? So very near to the um, ice sheet. So this is for Greenland up here. So right now there's so much mass there that the water in the ocean actually gets pulled towards that ice, right? It's very massive, it gets, there's a gravitational pull as strong, gets pulled towards it. As you start to lose mass, that water gets pulled a little less strongly towards the ice mass. 
So in the near field, sea level is actually dropping. So if you're very close to Greenland, sea level is actually going down a little bit. The further you are away from where you're losing ice, the more sea level goes up. I know it's a little counterintuitive, but if we're here in California, we're actually more worried about ice mass loss from the Antarctic ice sheet than we are from Greenland based on these fingerprints. And you can get a sense of that here. So this is just showing where um, the contributions come from in terms of the ice or the mass contribution for two cities, New York and Sydney. The scale on here is a little bit different at the bottom. Um, but you can see, say, for Sydney, that uh, it's much more affected by Greenland. It's much further away than Greenland, but much more affected by Greenland than, uh, than what we see from the Antarctic. All right. So to wrap up here, the tendency that we have with the satellite observing network is to um, start to push to smaller scales and closer to the coast, right? So we know based on the satellites we have now that, that sea level is changing on these global and regional scales. These are the satellite missions we have. One thing you can note, there's a steepening here. That's overlap of the missions. This is 92 on up through uh, into the future. So we have a lot of these satellites up there that tell us a lot about global and regional scales. But we also want to know what's happening more locally, right? So this is very simple that because of sea level rise, this moderate safety gap that coastal communities have is, is much narrower, right? So you have the safety gap where coastal communities are built relative to your typical high tide. You add sea level rise to that, your gap becomes much smaller. So you're really worried about what's happening on these local scales at the coast if we're talking about societal relevance. And again, I've talked mainly about the regional and global. It's this local piece that is most important, which Mark is going to talk about. I do want to note one other satellite mission that is launching in exactly one month from today, or a little less than one month. This is the Surface Water and Ocean Topography, or SWAT mission. So this is going to get us, again, our, satellite, our push on the satellites is to get closer to the coast and these smaller scale features. Um, SWAT is going to help with that. So our conventional radar altimeters can get us about 50 kilometers to the coast based on the measurement type. SWAT uses this radar interferometry. It gets us that much closer to the coast, actually sample on land so it can see lakes, reservoirs, uh, rivers, things like that. Um, but it's going to be able to see these smaller scale features. And I want to end here with this. So this is what the ocean looked like at different periods with the satellite missions. Okay, so this is CSAT, which goes back to the 1970s, GeoSat, which is the 1980s. You'll see the filter be placed over um, this, this map for uh, the more conventional altimeters, which I just talked about. So you can see you're starting to get some of that finer scale information. And this last one here will be for SWAT, this most recent satellite. You can see what it looks like. So we're essentially putting glasses on our satellites, right? We're taking this blurry image and we're adding, um, being able to see this really fine detail, which it's really critical, especially as you get closer to the coast. All right, and then one other way to look at this. So this is the sampling we had from the satellites in the past. So this is April, 2008. These are the ground tracks with the number of observations we had. April, 2008, April, 2022, you can see it's a little bit better. If we add SWAT into that, you're gonna get that much more coverage. And then if we zoom in here, again, it's a little hard to see, but you can, you're starting to fill in some of these gaps directly at the coast with that SWAT observation. So this is a satellite launching on December 12th. Um, everybody's really excited about it, and, and hopefully we can get, get more information about sea level closer to the coast. All right, so before I hand off to, to Mark, satellites are providing really good coverage on these regional and global scales, and the push is to get smaller spatial scales closer to the coast. Um, but there's still a lot of important missing information, right? We don't know exactly how some of the, the shorter time scale processes are contributing to the coast, and that's really what's most important as we push that baseline up with uh, this kind of global sea level rise signals, it really matters what's happening closer to the coast. And with that, I will hand it off to Mark. Yeah, thank you so much, Ben. And then it's so happy to see SWAT finally close launch date. Just for those people who are not familiar with the process, take about 20 years to launch a satellite from the first time the engineer walk into a scientist's office and say, if I measure this, what's, what, what you can do, right? So, uh, so happy. I cannot resist asking you a question. Did you post on Facebook or your answer? Is that uh, the USA Today reporter? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, second speaker, Mark Marinfield from Scripps. Thank you. Thank you. Um, looking at those, uh, that talkie, it's also, all of that was developed after you and I came out of graduate school. So, in our career, this has been the advancement in this field. And we are young men, so it's not, not very long. So, um, so yeah, I wanted to, to think about what happens when you take the information you get from these uh, global and regional uh, observing systems and how do you use it to come to right down into the, into the coast. And what 
additional information do you need to, to uh, make useful products for understanding when flooding is going to happen and what's going to happen in the future with sea level rise? So um, there are a lot of products out there now, NOAA, NASA, um, USGS, where you can get projections on different scales. This is a very nice one that's being put out through the, the NASA sea level team. And giving you an idea of how many flooding days per year in a place like La Jolla, you can expect for different scenarios going forward. Um, and this is a, does a very nice job of not only taking all the sea level variability that Ben introduced, but bringing in the tidal variability which has an interesting low frequency modulation to it. Um, but the missing piece here is the waves. And for a lot of the coastal zones that, um, that we want to protect, the wave component is a big part of this. And so how do you start to think about that, that wave component? This just illustrates kind of that, um, a little bit of a budget, but thinking every month of the year for a place like Del Mar, and you want to know what's the highest 2% highest hourly water levels you get at a place like that. So this is average over about 30 years of data. And so what contributes to those high water levels is the tide, which will vary um, twice a year as a cycle. Uh, the water level that Ben talked about, there's a kind of a seasonality to that, which contributes, and that can get much bigger during, during an El Nino year. And then the yellow bit is the waves, and the waves can be appreciable almost as big as the tides during some to some season. So getting the waves right is important for getting these total water levels at the coast. So these are the highest water levels ever recorded. This is just the 2% highest. And just to highlight what happens when we start to increase the sea level, that, that rising of all ships that, that Ben was alluding to just means that in the sea level um, framework, this red layer is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And there are more tides and more waves events that reach critical stage. This just keeps going up. This is with two feet of sea level, which is sort of a low level projection by the end of the century. Um, all year long, we'll be at a, at a point where the most severe events that we've seen at Del Mar will be a, a monthly occurrence. Um, and then uh, on and on from there. So getting this middle layer right is so critical, and that's why um, the, the work that Ben described is, is such an important part of that. But we are still interested in getting these other parts right. And so what about the wave component? So this illustrates for a place just south of here, Imperial Beach, and this is very common for coastal communities in California that exist near um, uh, uh, river mouse or deltas, right? I mean, this is where the water naturally flows down. So this is a low point on the land. And um, this community was built up in, in anticipating that sea level would never really get much above those rocks. And this was just a typical summer, a winter storm event not even a storm, there's no weather, local weather. These are just waves that are coming from the North Pacific. And uh, the combination of high tide, high regional water level, and high waves has pushed this past the threshold. So a place like Del Mar, or in this case, Imperial Beach, they would like advance warning about when these events are coming. They're really, they're just keying everything off the tide and they're not really adding all these components together. And then of course, how does it change with uh, the changing uh, changing water levels the, with uh, sea level rise projections. So um, we're trying to build up a system in California, working with a lot of different partners and agencies that are uh, trying to develop an observing system along the coast that gives us this first look at this kind of data. Surprisingly, a tide gauge is, is, is a kind of a common measurement. That's an easy thing to measure from a pier. How high the water gets and how much overrush and where the water got, that's a much more difficult uh, measurement. And there hasn't been really a concerted effort to document this. So we have very little information to um, uh, validate and improve models of coastal flooding because we just lack the fundamental data on how bad did it get under certain conditions. So the backbone of this is going to be understanding the wave component. And um, there's a group at Scripps called CDIP. Um, they work closely with NOAA. And uh, they're uh, the stewards of these wave buoys offshore. The wave buoys offshore are being put into a wave model uh, for the whole uh, west coast. And every 100 meters along the shoreline, there's detailed information about what the waves are, what the period is, direction, average period, uh, wave spectra, and how that's uh, projected going forward um, for, I think it's like six days uh, projections on each site. 
So hindcast data, forecast data, and um, this is the information that you'd want to use as an input to something to try and predict why did Imperial Beach flood. That's a tricky, um, there's a lot of physics in there because this is the surf zone. And so this is the turbulent boundary layer where you have to, given the incident wave height, predict how the, far the waves are going to get onto the shore. And as they're coming in, they're, they're actively eroding the beach. So in, uh, this was uh, some measurements we made in Imperial Beach. And during the course of a four-hour storm, the beach dropped by a meter. So you have to constantly, you have to take this into account when you're trying to predict these things. And until now, recently, there's been uh, very difficult to try and measure these bores as they've been coming into the shore. But now we have LIDAR technology, so laser ranging technology, which is actively giving us the, the full picture of how the beach is changing, how the waves are changing, how far they penetrate. And so these LIDAR systems are going to be the backbone of the observing system, coastal observing system for California. Um, if you want to be, uh, uh, do predictions during these active events, you have to understand how the bathymetry is changing, not only at the beach itself, but offshore. There's uh, bars moving around, sands moving around actively. And to get that into your models, you can do through understanding how fast the waves are moving. So the waves in shallow water, um, they move as fast as the water depth. So if you can track the water, the speed of the waves, uh, and do some a little bit of math to account for their amplitude, you can back out what the water level is. So we're, this is part of the system, is imaging the waves, understanding how fast they're moving, understanding what the depth is. That gets put into the model for the prediction. At the end of the day, you get these sorts of things. So the blue line here would be like a regular tide chart that you would use. Added on to that is the wave-driven, um, it's called run-up or... Um, how high the water is getting is vertically is associated with the waves themselves. And for different thresholds, you can see that um, how often it, it got there through the, uh, this winter event. And it, um, it is how it's manifested on the ground is that there are more and more high tides which are lifted above threshold because of this wave component. At, at present, for this particular storm, uh, we not only give the expected height, but also the probability, and these are the probabilities of flooding. When you start to add sea level rise to that, this is just 60 centimeters, which was a, a modest um, estimate for sort of an end of the century level. You can see how much, how many more of these high tide events become flood events. So this is what's gonna happen in the future is that you're gonna, everybody's gonna become a tide expert and everybody's gonna know exactly what the tidal range is because it's gonna be critical is it higher than usual high tide? Is it higher than mean high water? Um, and not only is it gonna get above flood thresholds, but these periods of flooding, the, the portion of the tide that is above threshold will become longer and longer. And so um, this will be what California has to deal with going forward. Having this advanced information has been useful for a city like Imperial Beach that doesn't have a lot of funds to, to combat this sort of thing. But at least they can get out in front of it with signage and warnings to the public, uh, getting um, a bulldozers in place for moving the sand around. Some shoreline protection can be made. So there is a definite advantage of having this early warning. And then having the early warning system also be the thing that you sort of assess how the long-term projection is going to play out has, a, has sort of a nice public perception piece to it because people start to understand what the, the warning is and how that is going to change with sea level rise. That's the ocean-facing shoreline in the bay. There's also some interesting dynamics, and we've been looking at how um, the water, the wave component within a bay like in San Diego Bay is going to contribute to, um, or how you need that to get accurate predictions of flooding around the bay. And um, just highlighting how kind of right at the threshold we are. So these are the low-lying areas around the bay that are zero, one meter, two meter, three meters above mean sea level. And so these are all within reach of current projection, projections for sort of 2100 to, to 2150, uh, just showing how much of the, of the surrounding shoreline is at risk here, including, I think, yeah, here we are at Liberty Station up in here. We're going to get up in a little bit of trouble. Um, I think I'll leave that for now. Um, so this, uh, the challenge for, for getting this, um, 
extreme water level component added on to what Ben was describing is that we need to not only understand the hydrodynamics, but also how the shoreline itself is changing. And so um, part of the solution here is going to be with satellites and trying to get things like beach width, beach slope from satellite imagery, which would then feed into the um, predictive skills of these models. This is just getting started out. The accuracies are still pretty low, but as these images get higher and higher resolution, this will become more and more of an important tool. Um, the other part of the problem that we're actively working on is, well, how, how do adaptation solutions work today? So if you do invest in something like a huge uh, nourishment project, as this is in Imperial Beach, how long is that sand going to be there? How effective it is at beating down this wave-driven flooding? Um, and, uh, you know, economically, is this feasible? And how long will this be feasible? Um, the other thing we've been looking at is how the water level is seeping into the groundwater and also the sewage systems and how that's affecting um, utilities uh, uh, and um, just the, the um, flood infrastructure of the uh, of city like Imperial Beach. So that's been um, that's been an interesting problem because a lot of the impacts of sea level rise will not just be right at the shoreline, but will feel these further inshore as these systems start to become uh, more endangered. I think that's it for me. Thank you very much. Yeah. So maybe we can invite Ben here. And then you, do you have an actual microphone? <laughs> OK, so we have, I have a little time to uh, ask each of the two speakers. And then... Yeah, my, my first question kind of Builds on the end, though, I saw where you put the slide up about the, the groundwater infiltration. How are you measuring that right now? How, how, I mean, the impact of seawater coming in on the groundwater. Uh, so we, we have wells that we've dug into the, so there are wells around the city. Uh, if you dig enough of those sort of going from the ocean inshore, you get a sense of how um, uh, that water seeps in as a function of different fluctuations in the ocean. So that's been critical for understanding that. So you're measuring the level in the well, in the groundwater well. Just simply the level tells you the information you need. It's okay. like a tide gauge in there. Right. You don't measure the salinity out of that as well? or Yeah, we do. And uh, that, that's that been important too through, during the rain events. Right. Yeah. Is there any changes in like the permeability of the rock or anything that, that's... Uh, what we've learned is... So a lot of what we've done in this area has been in Hawaii, which are these volcanic um, you know, yeah. basalt sort of very... Um, uh, they're like sieves. And here, the water that's like clay, uh -huh. and so it's not nearly as um, uh, the water doesn't interact as much. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So any other questions? So, <clears throat> are you aware of any work um, looking maybe 10, 20, 30 years down the road for for bridges, and you know what the impact of uh, of sea level rise is going to be on that for? existing bridges and, and potentially for uh, permitting of new bridges? I don't know of anything specific to uh, to bridges. Um, yeah, I guess I just, do, do you have any? Uh, not, not really. I mean, I know uh, there's been a lot of concern about the bridges that have been built along uh, uh, wetlands. So a lot of that, those bridges are particularly um, vulnerable going forward. But, um, you know, I don't, I don't know specifically about bridges, but just basically transportation routeways along the shoreline are susceptible to saltwater flooding, and there's a lot of concern about that. And Hampton Roads, uh, I saw, before I moved to, to JPL, I lived in Hampton Roads, Virginia, and we have bridge tunnels there, right? So they're, they're, they call them uh, bridges, but they're essentially tunnels. But access to those access points to those bridge tunnels is a big big concern with sea level rise, especially because there's not that many routes out of Hampton Roads. If there's a hurricane or something like that. So being able to evacuate or, or clear people off. But uh, yeah, so, so in general, transportation, I think, and uh, all, all of that is at risk with sea level rise. Any other questions? <laughs> Uh, my wife and I recently, okay, we'll do. Uh, my wife and I recently bought a condo in Imperial Beach, and we looked at the map, so personally appreciate the work that you've done uh, to decide where we buy that condo. But I was asking a question about, um, since you've been tracking over time, kind of the impact of 
of waves and, and tidal events and weather and all these things and the beach, beach nourishment project, which I know has been going on in IB for quite a while, are you able to use some of that data to say, okay, if you replenish the beach in such a way, it will actually provide additional benefits for coastal resilience? Yeah, we started to look at that. We have enough data now of the beach change, natural beach change, as well as the, the fate of some of these uh, replenishment events. And uh, it turns out that with sort of, that there are management practices that can keep pace for a while. And I think that the latest thing that we had was that uh, out to sort of mid-century, late to the second half of the century, um, standard practices should be able to keep the beach width in a reasonable state in many of these areas. But it starts to turn there. Yeah, I'm wondering about the ocean heat conveyor belts. Are, are you guys picking up any changes in these, these giant current um, yeah, conveyor so, belts? Yeah, there's a, a lot of focus on it. Um, and a lot of research going into it. So part it's it's kind of a signal to noise problem with uh, the other types of variability. So there's a lot of what we call interannual decadal scale. So like between I don't know, two and twenty year variability that that occurs naturally. So trying to pick out that climate change driven slowdown is is a work in progress. Um, we can look back over the the full twentieth century at some of the tide gauge observations that we have along the east coast of the U.S. and try to infer from there, but. Um, yeah, the, the, right now it's it's somewhat inconclusive. And then the models going forward, um, the, the recent IPCC 6 assessment report did discuss that the AMOC, that East Coast signal in particular, and um, there, there's so much disagreement spread amongst the models about how that'll proceed into the future. But I think that's a very active area of research and need to monitor to understand because that has a big impact on, on sea level rise in the East Coast and how quickly it could go up. It also has global impacts, obviously, not just on sea level. Yeah, this AMOC, uh, Atlantic over Meridiana overturning, there are some measurements, there are a couple of papers suggesting you can measure the small changes, but there are so many other processes going on, different time scales. The so still, still uh, convinced that there will be major changes, or, or do, does this lack of signal suggest that maybe these conveyor belts are more robust to sea level rise and fresh water? Oh, yeah. I think the mechanism, the physical explanation and how it will proceed based on what climate change will do, I think that's solid physics there that uh, you would expect to impact. I think it's some of the model disagreement is on the degree to which it will impact, say, sea level rise or, or the ocean. But I don't know if you have uh, thoughts on that, too. But. No, I, I mean, I think that um, the signal to noise issue is appreciated. So the data hasn't confirmed or, or yeah, dissuaded. First, before I go a second round. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. We're at the max. I stole it. I've heard this question a couple of times in other speeches. Um, if you had a magic wand, what's the one piece of tech or the one measurement you could get that would change your lives or you know change your research for the better? Yeah, so... so I didn't talk about this directly, but the um, the range of future projections of sea level is very heavily driven by what's going to happen with the West Antarctic ice sheet. So I, I don't know if you guys have heard of the Doomsday Glacier, Thwaites, Rapid Ice Sheet Loss, whatever the case may be. But right now, the, the spread that we have on the scenarios we can provide to planners it, it is almost entirely driven by that uh, that particular contribution. So if we had dedicated observations of some things that it would be like bedrock and some of the, the different um, pieces down there in the ice sheets uh, that could potentially have a dramatic impact on the money being spent for adaptation or ability to narrow a range. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, it's an active discussion within NASA as to how do you actually observe these things and get the, uh, the, the long-term measurements and monitoring you need. But um, in terms of a physical process, that would be the one with the most impact. Monitor ice, uh, melting rate or something. Or Thickness, yeah. But yeah, it's also seeing what's also seeing what's below the ice That's and right, uh, yeah. the yeah the relationship between right. the bedrock of the ice sheet and uh, I guess SWAT will do some of those. I think part of the secondary objectives. Yep. So I mean, SWAT's going to tell us a lot about um, the it, one thing SWAT will do with these smaller scales. Those smaller scale features, those uh, mesoscale eddies and fronts. Again, kind of the ocean weather. I guess.
guess, for like a, the weather that happens in the ocean, um, plays a big role in the ability for the ocean to uptake heat. So right now, I said 90% of the heat actually gets absorbed by the ocean. It's possible that the ocean could become less efficient at absorbing that heat and then dramatically change how Earth is responding to climate change. So SWAT's going to play a big role in helping us improve the models for the ocean role and, and ongo ongoing warming. Mark, what's your... What's your... Uh, well, I'm the oceanographer here, so I, I'll go for the ocean. Um, the floats that Ben showed, the Argo floats, are only, for the most part, only getting half the water depth. So there's some interesting um, phenomena happening at greater depths, and full monitoring of the ocean is just starting to pick up, and so more of those floats. Also, those floats are measuring physical properties, but we're starting to see a new generation. They're measuring biogeochemical properties. So we'll start to see changes in the ecosystems as well as just the physical system. Yeah, that's a, if you if you were the session yesterday, talk about one Argo now not only have a temperature salinity measurement, also have deep Argo go down to four six thousand meters. Biogeochemical Argo also anticipated to increase and then measure the biogeo chemistry, biology, monitor the ecosystem. So, yeah, just a little spin. That's kind of the question I was going to ask that Graham asked, but um, it. I guess I was thinking of all the sensors you use in terms of trying to be a leading indicator of a flood, right? So you have you have the LIDAR, you have CETA buoys, you have the NOAA tide gauges, you have maybe other things that are in the IO system that you didn't mention. Um, if, if I guess in terms of what the last question was, if you're specifically looking at uh, deploying some kind of new sensor technology to be a better leading indicator for flooding, what would that be? What's the gap right now? Well, I think... It, it's the, uh, it's the documentation of flooding. You know, it's understanding what the extent was, what the duration was, how high did the water get. Those measurements are going to take uh, a slightly different, um, it's, it's gonna be a little bit hard to standardize that measurement because every community is gonna require a slightly different retrofit of what would be required to do that. But there's also like a big citizen science component to that, getting more people involved in a, um, in a post, Post-event documenting what, what it was and with cameras and GPS and all that, um, we'll probably see more of that going forward. So, so it's not really more sensors at this point. It's, it's understanding how, how the impacts of the flood are so you can use the sensors you have right now more effectively. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Sort of, yeah. sort of a follow-up to that. Um, is... It, it, are the impacts detectable with with any satellites? Like, I mean, if you had a high resolution optical that takes a picture of a flood event, can you derive that kind of analysis from from the image, or is that not the kind of data you need? No, I think that you've probably seen a lot of those slider images post and pre storm, um, seeing the satellite change image, the change in the satellite images. I think that's an important piece, and uh, we're seeing more satellites going up with Planet and uh, other small systems and resolutions are getting better, we're getting more numbers. So that database will be incredibly useful going forward for sure. Yeah, within uh, NASA, we have a, a project called Opera, which is basically look across the entire network of satellites, the synthetic aperture radar, the optical uh, SWAT will be a role in this, but to, um, to standardize a surface water extent product, which would be able to detect these um, these flooding events and then build that information into models. Um, with any one satellite, it's a little bit of a needle in a haystack. I mean, the, the sampling for any individual satellite, the repeat orbit could be once every 10 days, once every 20 days. But if you look across the full set we have, and like Mark said, there's a lot of satellites up there an increasing number, we should be able to capture more of these events. Ben, I have a question. I, I cannot forget the Facebook story, so I want to have a question. I think we can we can launch many more satellites. We can write another couple hundred papers. I don't think the public can recognize that. Still, you have the similar posting, maybe a different taste um, on Facebook. What do you think we should do? Kind of spread out that awareness. Kind of, you know, we talk about reaching to the public more, and then try to. Um, to convey that scientific finding, you know, as far as I, we can tell, you know, you, we don't need more satellite to convince you know, the, the, ourselves, but how do we convince the public? Well, I mean, I think a lot of it is done at the, uh, the university level, engaging students and, and getting the word out in that way in terms of broader education, in terms of like public outreach and communication. Um, I think that's something we try to do within NASA, but 
think scientists are not always effective communicators. So I think it's a work in progress and we're, we're trying to um, provide more outlets and avenues. So like I, I'm the team leader of the NASA Sea Level Change team and one of our objectives there within the team is to have a public face to put out information that's accessible. So we have the portal at sealevel.nasa.gov trying to put information out that reaches a broad audience. So I think there is more dedicated effort um, to, to educate, but I, I don't know. It's, it's always going to be an, an uphill battle, I would say, given the, the, the way it's become politicized. I know we, we, we have been, we are doing more. When I was a project scientist for the Aquarius mission for Salinity, we dedicated a fixed percentage of money doing education, public outreach. I don't think is we, we accomplish what we want to do. So we, we probably have to change our strategy, do something different. I should also say that, I mean, with changes in administrations and priorities, that stuff is among the first to get cut, right? The education outreach piece. So it's not, not always consistent. I know you have a question, but I don't resist asking. Any other questions? Because those kind of things, those will happen. Because next year, next 10 years, right? So, so I, I think launching one satellite doesn't. It's kind of a nice story because Ben mentioned the, the Mike Freilich, Michael Freilich satellite. Mike Freilich started his career studying wave driven flooding at Scripps. So that's a whole cycle that kind of, yeah. Yeah, Mike Freilich uh, started PhD at Scripps and then he, he was a GPL for a few years, went to Oregon State, being a professor, being the dean. And then uh, eventually went to a NASA headquarters and then very instrumental pushing many of the earth science missions, including the salinity I work with, SWAT, and, you know, watching SWAT being killed, being reborn and multiple times and 20 years in the making. It's amazing. Fortunately, Mike was an oceanographer who got seasick. So yeah. he, he had to make it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just like me. I, I, I have one cruise as my last cruise. <laughs> I'm at zero cruises, so it's probably going <laughs> to stay there. You, you need to go to at least once to calibrate what you're measuring from space. That's what I did. They, all the engineer on the plane, they say, you're the only oceanographer, you are on boat. So I say, okay, <laughs> I did once. Any other questions before we can adjourn to go to the happy hour networking time? Okay, thank you for the speaker. Thank you.